Welcome to To the Foothills, a Colorado lifestyle and real estate podcast featuring mountain home real estate broker Robert Martin, who has over 25 years of experience assisting clients reach their goals and move forward. Tune in each week for a dynamic conversation with experts, Colorado adventurers, and residents that explores the ins, outs, and specific nuances of buying the perfect mountain home or selling your dream home in Evergreen, Conifer, Bailey, and surrounding areas to catch a glimpse into the Colorado lifestyle that's a part of you. Welcome to the podcast. Today, our guest is Tom Strauss. Tom, good to see you. How, how are things going today? Wonderful. I'm, uh, I've got a little bit of a cold this week, and, and that's a good thing because uh, my training, I go three on, so three high weeks and one off. Uh, easy week, and this is my easy week, so it's a great time to have a little bit of a cold, but that's, that's all good. It's good that it came upon your uh, slower week or your, your week right. off, so to speak. Well, tell that's us a little right. bit about yourself and your background and, and what you're really uh, interested in participating in these days. Okay. So uh, I was brought up in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, I lived kind of in the outer suburbs, basically the farm fields back in the 60s and the 70s. I guess before I should get in this, I should tell our listeners that um, I'm going to be 62 pretty darn soon. And I've been in the outdoors for uh, probably a little bit over 40 years now. So when I say the outdoors, I'm talking about the backcountry. So uh, yeah, uh, outside of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, I had a wonderful uh, childhood. My, the theme, I think, of my childhood was wildlife. So basically, we were uh, out in the farm fields, more or less. My boundaries were forests, farm fields, uh, streams, ponds, uh, fields, uh, that kind of thing. So when, when I grew up, I just needed to come home for supper. That was the main thing. Other than that, you know, my parents really didn't know where we were. But they didn't really worry about it because it was all outdoors and it was all, you know, we, there wasn't really a whole lot of trouble we could get in. But um, from there, uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I went to high school, of course, out in that area. I uh, went to college in uh, Wisconsin. And then I went and worked in uh, Chicago for about four years. Then I moved up to Minneapolis and St. Paul. I got my graduate degree up there. And while I was up there, I also was guiding into the Boundary Water. And so I did that for about 12 years. But at the same time, I was still doing my hiking and doing my backpacking. Um, I got into my backpacking pretty much through Boy Scouts at, uh, you know, at a pretty early age. And I think that got me into it along with my father who was a very big outdoors person. So every year we would go out on trips and things like that. So that's kind of how it started. Yeah, that's great, Tom. Um, 40 years, that's quite a while to be in the outdoors. And what was that like? Uh, your Boundary Waters experience? Well, the Boundary Waters, in my opinion, is one of the most beautiful places, at least in North and South America. Um, it's tough to get into now. You need a, a permit. Um, and certainly to get more people into the Boundary Waters, which is just uh, northern Minnesota, basically. And then the Quetico is on, in a, the uh, province of Ontario, and it's a southern section. The whole Boundary Waters and Quetico area is something like 4 million acres. So it's a big uh, it's one of the largest interconnected waterway systems in the world. So uh, it was a natural fit for me. Um, what I would take people up was mostly fishing trips. And I started that when I was young with my father. So it was uh, perfect for me, but I was also doing it full time. So, you know, whenever I got time off, it was always going up there. Well, I've heard great, uh, great stories about folks that have had the opportunity to spend time in Boundary Waters. Uh, portaging their canoes and you know fishing and and just uh, wonderful stories of the uh, being out in um, in nature. So Tom, you're a long distance backpacker and ultra hiker, yeah, or, or ultra runner rather. And um, why did you decide to start trekking such long distances? And how long you've been? Well, you've stated you've been doing it for 40 years, but mm -hmm. why did you start doing uh, the long distance? Right. So my background is kind of interesting. For uh, probably about 20 to 25 years, I was really only doing shorter backpack trips. I love the outdoors. I love the adventure. But, you know, we were only going at that time. This ultra distance backpacking wasn't uh, a big thing, really. And so we were only doing like 10 or 15 miles a day. And we were just having a grand old time. We were loving every second of it, you know. And 
um, there's nothing like it, you know, especially out in the West. And, you know, we would just kind of be all over the place. And uh, I guess it, it, I was actually about uh, 50 years old. And I knew about the Appalachian Trail at that time, but I really did not know about any of the other trails. I guess I was pretty sheltered. <laughs> and at that time, I, you know, I was living in the first of the Midwest, but then I moved out to the East Coast. So I really did not have a lot of exposure. And a friend of mine uh, at 50 actually gave me a book on, uh, on the PCT. And I was like, wow, I've never heard about this. This is, this is like right up my alley. So at 55 was really when I started getting into the long distance stuff. It just seemed to be a really natural fit for me. Um, I had some things that kind of went wrong in my life and then my parents died. And um, yeah, I had a couple of things that, that were pretty tough. And I asked my workplace if I could take some time off. And they allowed me to. And that's when I started the PCT. And I was 55 when I did my first long trail. But before then, I had pretty much covered a lot of the areas um, in all the national parks, most of the wildlife areas, you know, in the uh, west of the Mississippi. So it's never too late to get started on something that never uh, you're too passionate late. about. Hey, no way. <laughs> That's so awesome. You are um, in the throes of training for a trek, uh, the Continental Divide Trail, a trek that stretches over 3,000 miles through the United States from Mexico to Canada. Why this trail and, and uh, uh, how's it going for you? Right. The training. So I think my goal was, was uh, to do the three trails. Uh, and those would be, that would be the Pacific Crest Trail, the Colorado Divide Trail, and the Appalachian Trail. Those are the three major long trails. There's a lot of other ones, but those are really the hardest ones. And that's called the Triple Crown. So certainly when I finished the PCT, uh, I was hooked. And there was no question that I wanted to do the other two trails. And then, you know, as you go along, there's other things that pop up too that look interesting. So now it's not just the triple crown, but there's other ones along the way, which is great because I'm just going to keep on training. And I love to train. I love to do this stuff. So it's wonderful. So the kind of divide trail of the three trails is probably the hardest. And I wanted to get this one out of the way uh, right away before I get a little bit maybe older. And so I just want to, you know, get it done with. Um, the the kind of divide trail is interesting in that it's just similar to the PCT. I mean, you have the San Juans, and with the PCT, you have the, the High Sierras. So you that's you have to kind of um, schedule your trek so that you hit those about the middle of June, and either one of those because the snow is too high, you just can't get through. But about mid June, you should be able to get through. But then. You have about 2,000 miles from the San Juan all the way up to Canada, and you have about two months to do that. So you really have to book it. And um, the kind of divide trail is, is I think, um, last time it was 917,430 feet of elevation gain. So, you know, you're basically a billy goat, you know, going through the woods and you're moving because you get 2,000 miles in two months, basically, um, or maybe two and a half months. But you're basically going 25 or 30 miles a day without much of a break. So it is a tough trail, no question about it. What does a training day look like for you to prepare for uh, this trek? Right. So I started training in November. And remember, I'm 62 years old, okay? So we have to modify these for, for people who are younger, okay? <laughs> or oh, I will be 62 soon anyway. Um, so I would start November. So we're at about five months now. And uh, so you start slow. And like I said, I have three on and one off. So three hard weeks and then one is going to be an easy week. And you're basically building. And each week you're getting, you're building it up a little bit more. I'd say the core training uh, that I get into in more or less in January and February, especially in February, uh, a little bit into March. But I'm, I'm starting to get into 70 or 80 miles a week. And I break up my training uh, more into the, into the with a pack on. So of that, I would say maybe 75% would be with the pack and maybe 25% would be running because your running part is where you're going to get your endurance, but you have to do the pack. Not only do you have to condition your body with a heavier pack, but you also have to get your hip set and everything else. And I think, you know, there are some people who don't train, I guess, if you're 20 years old, you can do that. But when you get older, you know, it's really important. But my training day, you know, usually is going to get out of the house about eight or nine o'clock. And I'm going to be on the trail around here where I live in Evergreen, Colorado, for uh, about five or six hours a day, usually. So um, some people listening, Tom, 
might think, um, wow, that's fairly extraordinary to, you know, to be on the trail that for that extended period of time. And obviously you're taking the time to train and, and be prepared for it. Um, why do you say you're hooked or what is it about it that, uh, that drives you to, uh, to do these treks? Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, there's two great things. Um, first of all, just the hiking alone. I always say, and I told you this, and I told other people this, and I have an endorphin party every single day of my life. Since I've been retired, I retired early. So going out there and hiking, especially in this area where it's just beautiful weather, and even in the wintertime, see, I don't have an issue with, with the snow and all that kind of stuff. Some people do, but I don't. But regardless of the weather, I mean, you're just moving, and you're in the outdoors, and you're in the fresh air. And a lot of times you're in the sunshine, and there's nice people out there to talk to. And an ancillary benefit is that, you know, I wear headphones now. Now, I don't do it all the time, but but I'm also able to ex expand my horizons from the things that I listen to, whether it is, you know, an autobiography, or I think I told you I really like, uh, I'm a his history buff in so many ways. So, I mean, a, a five or six hour hike goes by in a heartbeat. You know, I sometimes I'm thinking, you know, my big uh, guy uh, in the revolution was John Adams. And so, you know, John Adams was always uh, arguing with the people he read. And sometimes I feel the same way, I, you know, when I'm reading and when I'm listening to stuff and, you know, of what I agree with and what I don't agree with. But, but it's a wonderful, all around a wonderful experience. You know, if you got the animals, there's just so many wonderful things. So it's sort of been an evolution. You certainly are out in nature. You can see, like you said, everything that that brings to you, but also um, putting some other stuff into your mindset which are healthy and interesting and and kind of it's kind of like your Wilson you know your keeps your company while you're out there you know it keeps me company I don't always do it but I have found that it is really nice especially when there's not a lot of people around you know sometimes you don't want it on you don't like what the, when there's a lot of mount, you know in our area that we get mountain bikers and stuff like that and so you have to be pretty cognizant of them so you don't always want to do it but a lot of times during the weekdays Monday through Friday it's nice. So for your trek, Tom, how do you pack for such a long journey? Right. I guess I want to approach this in two ways. So I'm just going to back up to say when I was younger, in my 20s and my 30s, and I was doing this kind of stuff, um, I was always using used equipment. I never, because I never really knew if I really liked it or not. I wasn't positive about it at that time. And the equipment is so expensive. So I would, and it, it's a heavier but heck, when you're 20s and you're 30s, whether you're a man or you're a woman, I mean, you've got a lot of strength and you should be able to do that. I, I just sometimes when I see some of these people going out there and spending a huge amount of dollars on some of this ultralight stuff, I, I sort of question it because, I mean, we're strong when we're young. Mm -hmm. But when you're older, it's a little bit different. OK, plus you have a little bit more expendable cash, possibly. Exactly. But, you know, so now I'm a little uh, lighter and I'm able to afford some things. but. Uh, yeah, my, my pack is generally pretty light. Um, it, there's a difference between when you're packing for like the desert and stuff like that versus when you're in the mountains. So when people are always asking me, how much do I have in my pack? And it's, it's really a tough question because it changes with food, it changes with water, it changes with where you're backpacking and stuff like that. But um, you're usually talking about a base weight. It's usually the best way to handle that. And... Um, your base weight is everything but your fuel and your food. And generally speaking, if I'm in the desert backpacking, so I just, you know, you just don't have a lot of clothing. You don't have a lot of stuff. I'm going to be probably somewhere around eight pounds is going to be my base weight. And then when I'm in um, the mountains and stuff, my base weight is going to be around 10 pounds. So for me, when I'm out there, it varies so much like on the kind of divide trail that I'm doing now. I mean, I'm going to have two day backpacks and I'm going to have eight day backpacks. So it all depends, you know, on how many days of food, you know, you have and all that kind of stuff. It depends upon, of course, if you have to do a food drop, you grab your food and then also water. If you're carrying water or if you've got a, a good supply of water with you, your backpack weight possibly doesn't exceed 25 pounds, somewhere in that range, would you say? Or Yeah, I would say generally speaking on this trip, I'd be surprised even on an eight day push. I'd be surprised if my pack's up. For me, it's going to be over uh, 25 pounds, you know. But um, like on, when I was on the PCT, like in the desert, and I was carrying uh, maybe five or six 
a liter's of water, maybe more, you know, and a liter of water is 2.2 pounds. You know, that adds a lot to your pack. I'm, I was carrying there sometimes 45 to 50 pounds. Mm-hmm. And you, you go on long ways, you know, 20, 25 miles. So, yeah, it's a, it's a totally different volume. What is um, your anticipated time frame, Tom, to complete the trek? Right. So I'm looking, I'm hoping, well, I'm going to be starting on May 3rd uh, down at the border. They call it Crazy Cook, and it's on the border of New Mexico and Mexico. It's right at the boot heel. Mm-hmm. And I expect to finish, I expect to be in the San Juans about the middle of uh, June. And then I expect to finish about uh, September 6th. We'd like to check in with you later when you're on the trail. So we'll hook up and see how things are going for you. How's that sound? Good. I would love to do that. Be, That'd be awesome. Be fun. I know you did a through hike of the Colorado Trail last year. Right. Uh, do you have a favorite trail to hike in Colorado? Maybe aside from that, or is that it? Oh boy, that's a tough one because there's so many beautiful trails. Um, let's see. Well, certainly the San Juans is going to be one of my favorites. Uh, the San Juans is so open, and uh, it just has so much diversity to it. One thing that's kind of strange about the San Juans right now is there's a lot of beetle kill. So there's a lot of brown. Until you get down towards like Silverton and down that area, then it's going to start to get green again. But along the Colorado Trail right now, there's just a lot of beetle kill, which is concerning for, you know, down the road with fires and stuff like that, that it could be kind of interesting. Um, But that stretch from Silverton to Durango is really beautiful. We're up high. There's a lot of moose. Uh, I was in there in, in August and it is really one of the most beautiful sections uh, that I have been in for, for quite some time. So, yeah, that down in there is one of the most. Yeah, that's great. And like you said, there's so many. And if you're not doing a, if you just want to do a day hike, too, there's so many places near, you know, near the foothills or just up into, oh, uh, into the foothills, for sure. It's unbelievable. You know, I'm in Evergreen, but I was down in Connor for last week and we were up in that Reynolds Ranch area. And in Evergreen alone has some really spectacular, I can walk up my door in Evergreen. This, you know, maybe we'll get into this a little bit later, but literally I can go just about 40 miles without crossing too many paths, you know, twice. And going up that Pioneer Trail, which is that concrete trail, which is a godsend to Evergreen, in my opinion. But going all the way that and getting up to Commandos and coming all the way back to my house, I can do about 40 miles without much of a problem. Now, I, I'm not saying I'm doing that with a big pack on, but like when mm. I was training for the Colorado um, Trail and I was doing a lot of ultra running and stuff, you know, that's what I, that's what I was doing. Just um, hopping out your front door and hopping hitting the trail. Front door. Yeah, that's right. Yep. Now, if someone wanted to start getting into trekking, uh, where should they start or what, what might you suggest uh, if they wanted to kind of get their feet wet? Now, when you say trekking, are you talking about backpacking or? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Let's say backpacking, maybe they want to start out doing some shorter treks, obviously not jumping in on the, the longer uh, treks right. that you're doing, but right. yeah, just the so, shorter ones to get started. Right. So that's a great question. And I think this that's an important question because I think um, this is now my own perception of how it works, but I've been doing this for a long time and I've seen a lot of people kind of come and go. And not everybody's cut off for this, that's for sure. But one thing that I would make sure of is if you, I would start out with just a really short and probably pretty easy trek if you can do it. Not a lot of elevation if you're coming out here. You know, if the East Coast, you're not having a lot of elevations. I don't, on a trek, I don't think if I went on the East Coast, I would start out the whites necessarily. One thing is that I think you want to start out, you know, you want to make it successful. So you want to make sure that you have really nice weather. You know, if, you, if you're getting into the rain, forget it. You're not going to come back. That makes it really tough. So I would say your first couple of times, just make sure you do something nice and easy. I would do maybe five or 10 miles a day at the most. And in beautiful weather, I would get in along some, um, some streams or some lakes, you know, where you can camp, things like that. And I would go with a group of people. I don't think I, I'm not sure if I would necessarily do it alone. I think backpacking, one of the great things about backpacking is being on the trail, which is great alone. But then you get to in the towns and you get to see people and you get to talk to people and you you know, that kind of a thing. You know, I think a little bit of a diversity would also be nice. And as we've talked, Tom, um, I had the pleasure of working with you. And, and uh, as far as when you moved uh, to the area from the East Coast, and it was a place that you would desire to live live in for quite a while because of your interest in being in the backcountry and hiking and trekking and, and long distance running. And um, right. that evolution worked out for you. And 
we've talked too about you having a coach that kind of helped you and and kind of got you uh, some good ideas and some mentoring uh, for for your interest in in doing what you love to do. So mm -hmm. now that you're in Evergreen, and um, one of the things you just mentioned, uh, I think, is one thing that is quite nice is you can just jump out your front door and uh, and go on a hike. So if it was that one of the things you might highlight as being uh, one of the pluses of living in Evergreen or what are some of the things that, that you like about being in the area? Right. So I'm just going to back up and, and let the listeners know that, you know, it took me a while to, to get a house here. What I did is uh, I really didn't know where I wanted to live. I mean, I had been backpacking all over the country and I had seen different things, but I knew the really two big hubs of backpacking were really up in the Northwest and also in Colorado. So I knew that. But I just wasn't sure. So I, so I spent uh, actually a couple of years in, in my vacation time and I flew out to Seattle area and kind of got a flavor out there. And then I flew down to Flagstaff and then the Santa Fe and just some of the different areas that were close to the mountains, you know, where you could live and you, you could get in there. And then I came to Colorado and uh, I actually started um, up in uh, north of Boulder. What's the town that's north of Boulder up there? Uh, uh, Netherlands. Netherlands. Netherlands yeah. I started in Netherlands because that's really some good backpacking up in there. The kind of the divide trail is not too far. It's over on the other side of the range there. But it just wasn't a good fit for me. And as soon as I got into Evergreen, I'll never forget this. It was about 4 o'clock in the evening. And uh, I came up uh, on 74 there up over the ridge into Evergreen. And it just opens up into the mountains there. And you didn't really see the lake. But the sun was hitting it from the back, you know. I was like, oh, my, this is it. I knew it right then. <laughs> that this is where I wanted to be. It was, the most beautiful, it was beautiful. It was a beautiful valley. I've seen a lot of valleys in my time. And I know what's beautiful. And I was like, wow, this is really nice. And then, you know, it, then you start getting everything else with where we live here. You know, Denver, from where I live, I can get to Denver, a major metropolitan area in 35 minutes. So all the places that I had been to looking, like in Seattle and, and all of them, Nothing offered anything like that. And so that is one thing that's really unique. I mean, I can, you know, of course, you know that I like the theater and I like classical stuff. And I, you know, I like it all. I love art, all that kind of stuff. So, in fact, I was just in the art museum yesterday with somebody and we went down into the um, Southwestern Art uh, Museum, which is spectacular, by the way. Um, it really is. But, I mean, look at this. I can walk out my door and I can hit some of the greatest hiking trails around you know, out my door. And then I, all I have to do is drive 35 minutes. I can be in downtown Denver and I can have all the restaurants I want. I can have all the theater I want. I can have art, everything. And I don't know if there's anywhere in the country where you can do that. I really don't. I haven't found it. And now, so that's just kind of one thing. But then you talk about the beautiful weather here. I mean, it's spectacular, and especially if you're in the foothills. I mean, it is nice. I mean, you have a nice breeze all the time. I had my doors open all the time. There's no bugs. There's no, there's nothing. It's great. I, agree. I just love every, yeah. everything I, about this place. I love, you know, that I just, this is really a great fit for me. And I think it would be a great fit for just so many people. Well, it's easy to tell you uh, do have some enthusiasm that you're sharing, but no, that's wonderful. And I think a lot of people feel that way, Tom, uh, the proximity to the city and just living in that nature it just uh, affords a, a very relaxing and peaceful, peaceful way to live. So if I was buying a house and, and you were giving me some insight into purchasing a mountain home, would there be anything you would share with me? Well, I, yeah, I'll, I'll talk to you specifically about Evergreen, okay? Well, first of all, um, so I've been around, okay? I've been on the East Coast, I've been in the Midwest, I've been in Chicago, you know, I've been around with it. I live in Jefferson County. And I will like to say that I think Jefferson County is a really great county. The people work hard. The services are great. I was out not too long ago, and I saw somebody scrubbing the outhouse, the outside of an outhouse. I've never <laughs> seen that in my life. <laughs> I know it's kind of weird, but I, it's like, wow. And it's not just the outdoor stuff, but it's everything. It's everything. You know, the tax base is great here. So I love Jefferson County, and I wanted, you know this, I wanted to move in Jefferson County. That was really important to me. So that's my take on it. I, I think if I had to tell somebody one thing, and I have told this to other people, that's what I would tell them. 
What would you say is one of your favorite things, if not the most favorite thing about living in Evergreen? Let's see. Well, certainly the access to the trails is wonderful. I think that it's, I mean, I have a wonderful neighborhood. It's a very stable, wonderful neighborhood here. Um, I'm right by the downtown area. So I have brew pubs here. I have pretty good food here. So that in the access to the downtown Denver. Absolutely. So um, you'll be heading out next month and we would like to uh, possibly reconvene with you down the road. Uh, it was certainly a pleasure, Tom, uh, visiting today. And um, gosh, we wish you the best. What, how long do you think that uh, your trek will take and when do you think you'll be completing? Yeah, so I, it's got to go four and a half months because okay. you, you have to be able to, you have to get out of Canada by about um, mid-September because it just gets too darn cold in the snow and the grizzlies, you know, get pretty hungry about that time. So <laughs> that's much hungry, hungry but, yeah. but, but bold. Sure. You know, I, that, I don't want to sound bad because there's so much sensation around the grizzlies and stuff. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I've been, I've been in that country a long time. It's just not big of an issue as people think it is. But you also have, you can't be stupid. I mean, you have to respect all of that kind of stuff. So, so yeah, about four and a half months, about mid-September, I should be done. Well, we wish you the very best. And I really appreciate you jumping on the podcast today. Well, thank you, Robert. And I appreciate it too. It's always a great uh, to talk with you. You know that? Yeah, and we'll, um, we'll, uh, we'd like to jump on with you somewhere down the road, maybe in a couple of months or so, and see how things are going for you. Okay, great. Sounds good, Robert. Thank right, you. Tom. Yeah, you take care of yourself. To the Foothills, a Colorado lifestyle and real estate podcast. On the podcast, I interview real estate experts, Colorado adventurers, and residents who enjoy the serenity and lifestyle of living in our mountain communities. Tune in each week for a conversation that explores the ins and outs of buying the perfect mountain home or selling your dream home and catch a glimpse into the Colorado lifestyle that's a part of you.